Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk about the cyanotic congenital heart defect here. And uh, we'll do a quick review of the basic cardiac physiology, both adult and fetal. I'll talk about an approach to congenital heart disorders, and then we'll talk about the cyanotic disorders, and then some pediatric issues of relevance that relate to some of the cyanotic disorders. In the other section, I went over the non-cyanotic disorders. Um, we're not going to touch on those here, uh, but uh, it's worth looking at those if you haven't already. So uh, this is the adult circulation, and um, as you can see here, we've got the vena cava going into the right atrium, and then that's separated by the, uh, by the tricuspid valve uh, to the right ventricle, and then from the right ventricle, we go into the pulmonary arteries, and that's separated by the pulmonic valve, and we go in for oxygenation into the lungs. Coming back from the lungs, oxygenated, we come back through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, and then from the left atrium, uh, we go into the left ventricle uh, via the mitral valve or bicuspid valve, and then we go into the aorta uh, via the uh, aortic valve. And then up here, we've got the uh, right brachiocephalic, the left common carotid, and the left subclavian. And this is the arch of the aorta and then the descending aorta. Now, in the left ventricle and left atrium, you should know that in the adult, and by adult, I mean pretty much everybody after a few hours after birth, in most cases, the pressure in the left heart is much higher than the pressure in the left heart. So, illustrating that, uh, this is just the normal pressures in the heart in millimeters of mercury. When you see a line, that's just dividing systolic over diastolic. So, as you can see here, uh, from ventricle to ventricle, you got about 110 millimeters of mercury uh, difference. I wouldn't memorize these. I would just know that you got a in the uh, in the developed heart circulation. You've got higher pressure in the left than on the right. I would memorize the left atrial pressure though because that's the same as the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. That's eight to twelve millimeters of mercury. That's a really good one to know because this corresponds to the pressure of your pulmonary veins and all works with congestive heart failure, uh, and that's kind of important to know for. Uh, some of your valvular disorders too. All right, so this is the fetal heart circulation here. And uh, one of the big differences with the fetal heart circulation is that there's an atrial septal defect, uh, but it's not really an atrial septal defect uh, quite yet. It's a normal uh, uh, part of the anatomy of the fetal heart, and that is the uh, foraminal valley. And with the foraminal valley does, it allows blood to move uh, from the right atrium to the left atrium. That's going to be really important. So remember that in the fetal heart, you have a higher pressure in the lungs because the lungs aren't working. They're not supposed to. The The baby is in, uh, is in amniotic fluid, so there's no way it can breathe. It's not supposed to use its lungs yet. And so we want, we don't want the blood to go to the lungs because there's there's uh, there's there's nothing for for the blood to do there. There's no oxygen there, and so what this foraminal valley does is it shunts the blood from the right side to the left side. And the same thing for the ductus arteriosus. Uh, and that's uh, it's, it's a passive process because you have a higher pressure on the right side than on the left side. The total opposite of what you have in uh, in the uh, matured heart circulation after birth. So here's uh, the movement of blood. So it comes in through the vena cava. Uh, it bypasses the lungs, uh, both by uh, crossing the foraminal valley from right to left, high pressure to low pressure. And the blood that does not pass the foraminal valley, that does get into the right ventricle, ultimately will go from the right ventricle into the pulmonary circulation, which can cross then again through the ductus arteriosus, which is another important part of the, uh, of the fetal heart. And that moves blood from the, uh, the initial pulmonary circulation uh, to the aortic circulation. Uh, so this is how blood moves uh, in the fetal heart. You have two ways of getting blood from your right to left heart, the foraminal valley and the ductus arteriosus.
First off, though, when we have congenital heart disorders, uh, the symptoms often include murmur, fatigue, and wheezing, and that's just because of the disorder of the heart, where we get the murmur. The fatigue and wheezing is due to uh, disorders with the lungs that can be due to pulmonary hypertension. Failure to thrive uh, can be due to the fact that the kid doesn't have enough oxygen, so they're breathing heavily, more heavily, more rapidly, and so they're not able to feed as much. Uh, and they may have signs of acute or chronic cyanosis, particularly in these cyanotic heart diseases. The, now, the non-cyanotic diseases that we talked about involve movement of the blood from the left to the right. Those are somewhat less severe, and they can present during childhood or even during adulthood. Surgery is not necessarily needed for those. But with these cyanotic disease, these involve movement of the blood from the right to the left. And this is a big problem, because what kind of blood do we have on the right? We have deoxygenated blood. And if that's going into the aorta and mixing with oxygenated blood, we're going to have less oxygenated blood going to our tissue, and that's going to cause cyanosis. So it's a big problem. It's a problem when blood is moving erroneously from any side to any side, but particularly when it's moving from the right to the left. And that's why these cyanotic diseases are a much bigger deal. The age of the patient and their symptoms are going to guide your differential. In, in young, young babies, typically the, it's, a, it's a cyanotic disease. Uh, if it's an adult, it's pretty much always a non-cyanotic disease. The age of the patient and the symptoms will guide your differential. But the best initial diagnostic test, regardless uh, if you suspect a congenital heart disorder, is an echocardiogram. And any patient with congenital heart disorder uh, needs antibiotics before dental procedures. Okay, so the first we're going to talk about is tetralogy of fallow. And it's called tetralogy because there's four problems. But really, there's only two problems, and those two problems cause the other, four, the, cause the other two. So what are the first two problems? These anatomic problems that you've got which cause the other two problems. First off, you've got an overriding aorta, and what that means is that the aorta is not just over the left ventricle like it should be, but it's kind of over the left ventricle and kind of over the right ventricle too. So you've got an overriding aorta, riding over kind of the left and the right ventricle. You also have a ventricular septal defect. So remember, the ventricular septal defect was one of the defects that we talked about as a non-cyanotic heart disorder. But here now you've got this overriding aorta. And because you have an overriding aorta, blood can shunt from the right to the left. And that's why this is a cyanotic disorder. Now what else do we get with the Tetralogy of Fallow? Well, because we've got blo more blood mixing between the right and the, right and the left ventricles, we can get more blood moving into the pulmonary arteries. And because you have more blood moving into the pulmonary arteries, guess what? That's going to cause pulmonary uh, hypertension and ultimately pulmonary stenosis. Uh, and when you have pulmonary stenosis, that's going to cause right ventricular hypertrophy because it has to pump harder. And so all of these things are related to each other, but it's really the first two that come about, and then three and four are subsequent. So the increased right, right ventricular pressure, just because of the increased blood, causes the right ventricular hypertrophy, and then the extra blood in the pulmonary circulation causes the pulmonary stenosis, and it also doesn't help that when you have the pulmonary stenosis, that increases your pulmonary pressure, and that's also going to cause right ventricular hypertrophy. So all of these things are related. But what's most important, what causes the disease, what causes the symptoms, is that you've got shunting of the blood from right to left because you have this overriding aorta and this ventricular septal defect. So this is a congenital cyanotic heart deficiency involving a, a ventricular septal defect and an overriding aorta which also re results in pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular hypertrophy. Typically, tetralogy of fallow 
presents during childhood, but it can present at any time. Uh, usually it's during three to six years when the kid's getting up and moving and running around and is more active and thus requires more oxygenation. The patient, depending on how old they are, or care, care, caregiver will describe spells. Uh, they may not say spells, but these symptoms will come on suddenly and will be intermittent. And what these are called are TET spells, in which the patient becomes acutely cyanotic, maybe dizzy, and this is relieved by squatting, typically relieved by squatting. And you'll see this in vignette after vignette. The patient becomes cyanotic, and it's relieved by squatting, and they're usually in this sort of preschool age group. Symptoms, because they're cyanotic and they have these spells, and even in between the spells, they're usually cyanotic too, um, just less so, they have chronic cyanosis. So they'll have some of the signs of chronic cyanosis, which include finger clubbing. A lot of times, because they have general failure to thrive, they'll be in a low height percentile, or they may even be below the fifth percentile. And then you can often hear the systolic murmur, and that's often heard at the left third inner space. Uh, the diagnosis is uh, an echocardiogram, as all of these congenital heart defects are. EKG, if it's been done, which this is not your best diagnostic test, but if there's been an EKG done and you happen to see it, if you do see it, it will likely possibly show right ventricular hypertrophy, which is uh, one of the four things that we see in tetralogy of fellow. And remember, right ventricular hypertrophy, you're just looking on your right ventricular leads and you're going to see a higher QRS spike. Um, you could also see a uh, shift uh, to, the, uh, to the right side of your axis. The treatment here is prompt surgical repair. So all of these cyanotic defects are going to need repair. It's not like uh, not like atrial septal defect where we can kind of wait on it, ventral septal defect where we can maybe wait on it. All of these are going to need repair. So tetralogy will need repair. It's not emergent, but it should be prompt. And so it's worth pointing out that tetralogy of fallow is the most common cyanotic congenital heart defect. So here's cyanosis. You can see it in the lips, but particularly you can see it in the mouth. So looking in the oral mucosa is a great place to look for cyanosis. And then here's some cyanosis here. You kind of see a little bit in the lips, but you can also see it in the perioral area. And I bet if you were to look inside at the oral mucosa, you'd see, uh, you'd see it even more. Here's clubbing of the fingers. Now, granted, I found the most obvious case I could uh, of clubbing of the fingers, but uh, it's not always this obvious. But this is just a great example. And here's squatting. I don't know. This is just a kid roughly in the uh, in the tet spell age three to six who's squatting I don't know if this kid has tetralogy but this is the kind of squatting that you would see okay here's another one transposition of the great arteries look here at what's wrong so you can see what's wrong here and what's wrong is that you've got your aorta running over your right ventricle and your pulmonary arteries coming out of your left ventricle. And this is a problem because now you have two circuits that are sort of running on their own. Uh, so you've got deoxygenated blood going through your vena cava, going back to your pulmonary, or going back to your uh, uh, systemic circulation and moving back to your vena cava and going around and around. You've got oxygenated blood going to your lungs and then back to your left heart and then back to your lungs. So this is a problem. This is something that's going to be noted uh, early on, so usually during infancy. There are three things that keep this patient alive because you can imagine that if you have this, 
you're going to be dead. You can't survive if your blood's not getting oxygenated. But there's some good news is that usually with these patients, they've got a few things that keep them alive that would normally we wouldn't like. But for these patients, it keeps them alive. So atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, and the patent ductus arteriosus. Those three things keep these patients alive. It allows some shunting, even though you're moving from lower, uh, lower to higher, it allows some shunting of, well, I guess you're moving from higher to lower here. It allows some shunting uh, over to uh, your aorta side so that you're getting oxygenated blood um, uh, into your systemic circulation. So these are major sources of life for these patients. This is what keeps them alive. So under no circumstances prior to surgery would you want these to close. And actually that's going to play a big role in the medical management prior to surgery. So as mentioned, this is a congenital cyanotic heart defect where the aorta communicates with the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery communicates with the left ventricle. And this is a big frickin' deal to uh, quote our vice president, Joe Biden. Uh, this invariably, invariably presents in the first 48 hours of life, and the infant is going to be very, very sick, very, very cyanotic. And this is going to show progressively worsening acute cyanosis, progressive pulmonary edema, tachypnea, and there may or may not be a systolic murmur. Diagnosis is echocardiogram, and the treatment are going to be two things. First off, you're going to put the kid on IV prostaglandin E1. And the prostaglandin does the exact opposite thing as indomethacin. Remember indomethacin we use to close the patent ductus arteriosus? This is the exact opposite what we want to do here. Now we want to make sure it stays open because this open ductus arteriosus is keeping this child alive. If this shut, the kid would die. So we want to give them something opposite. Uh, to endomethacin, and that's indeed prostaglandin E1. Remember, endomethacin is an NSAID. Those work against prostaglandins. So we give the child with transposition of the great arteries prostaglandin E1 to keep their ductus arteriosus open to keep just that little source of oxygenated blood uh, moving through, and you're going to need to do corrective surgery as soon as possible. So this is just palliative. The prostaglandin is just temporary before we can get them over to surgery. And then you're going to need to uh, do a corrective surgery as soon as possible. So here's a child before operation. And you can see that there's some cyanosis of the lips here. And here's a happy red face, pink baby. Uh, and there's the incision site and they just go in uh, from the uh, thorax laterally and do the repair. So there's a lot of different presentations, a lot of different anatomic variants of trans transposition of the great arteries. This is just the basic one, the basic form that you need to know, the basic idea of it. Okay, truncus arteriosus is somewhat uncommon compared to the other two, but it's worth mentioning. So truncus arteriosus is similar to transposition. However, with truncus arteriosus, we have a common uh, valve site where the pulmonary artery and the root of the aorta come off from. So you've got a right and left ventricle and a pulmonary artery and a aorta, and it's like they're all combined into one. And that's a truncus arteriosus, or a persistent truncus arteriosus, technically. And so you're going to get mixed blood going into your pulmonary circulation and to your aorta. So usually this presents in the neonatal period of cyanosis. It'll be progressive, worsening cyanosis, faint and purple lips, similar to what you saw in TGA and the child will often be pale, sometimes you can have sudden shock. And that sudden shock would be when the ductus arteriosus closes. Again, because this is another source of oxygenated uh, blood. And it's also a source of blood overall. 
Uh, with truncus arteriosus, and this is sort of 99th percentile material, but with truncus arteriosus, a lot of times you have uh, narrowing between the uh, between the common carotid and the subclavian arteries, and so you get a little bit of hypotension with this. So the best initial therapy, again, because, well, the best diagnostic test is an echocardiogram, as you probably figured out by now. Best initial therapy is prostaglandin E1, because we want to keep that, uh, we want to keep that ductus arteriosus open, and then corrective surgery as soon as possible, like within 24 hours. All right. Okay. There's one thing I wanted to mention that I think I forgot with tetralogy. And that is that if you were to have an x-ray and you may see an x-ray on the USMLE, I didn't put one on here, you may see this boot-shaped looking heart. It's a boot-shaped heart. And what that is is right ventricular hypertrophy. So a boot-shaped heart. All right. Sorry for my phone going off there. So some related pediatric topics. Um, first off, what I want to talk about that I didn't write anything about on here is Eisenmenger's syndrome. Eisenmenger's syndrome is something that happens with non-cyanotic heart diseases. And the non-cyanotic heart diseases, remember, are the left to right shunts. And usually that's not so much of a big deal but you've got increased flow to your pulmonary vasculature. And what happens then is that because that's taking extra pressure, you're going to get stenosis of the pulmonary vessels. And so you're going to have an increased and increased and increased workload on that right ventricle to pump against that, uh, that increased resistance because your pulmonary vasculature is stenosing. And ultimately what's going to happen is your right ventricle is not only going to become hypertrophic, but the pressure is going to go up to the point where now you're going to be shunting blood rather to the uh, lungs. You're going to be shunting it backwards to the left heart. And so a uh, left to right defect, if it's left untreated long enough, it can go into a left, uh, into a right to left defect a cyanotic defect. So that's one thing that I want to point out. Okay, Vactoril. So this is uh, a place where you're going to see many congenital heart defects as part of a wider syndrome known uh, as a Vactoril constellation or a Vactoril association. And this is uh, just an abbreviation. So V for vertebral anomalies, A for anal atresia, C for cardiac defects, which is our congenital heart defect, T, uh, T and E for tracheoesophageal fistula. You can think of the T as also meaning tetralogy of fallow because that's the most common uh, defect to occur with Vactoril. And truncus, arteriosus. Renal anomalies are also seen in these kids and limb defects. So this is a sort of a pediatric topic, uh, but you should be aware that uh, with this constellation, uh, that congenital heart defects are quite common. And so any patient that's got uh, one or two of these that you notice on first glance, you should definitely get an echocardiogram to see if there's any kind of heart defect uh, in association with uh, the limb defect, vertebral anomaly, renal anomalies, and so forth. I'll address this in, in greater detail eventually someday when we talk about pediatrics. Another one is DeGeorge syndrome. So DeGeorge syndrome is a deletion on the short arm of chromosome 22. And a great way to remember DeGeorge syndrome is the mnemonic catch 22. So catch 22 is a coloboma, abnormal facies, thymic aplasia, which results in T-cell deficiency, and then ultimately immunodeficiency from that, cardiac def defects, which is usually tetralogy of fellow, hypercalcemia due to hyperparathyroidism, and then the 22 is just referring to the chromosome with the deletion. So catch 22. What is that abnormal facies? It's a retrognathia, a microagnathia, meaning a small chin, a long face, a high 
broad, or broad nasal bridge, so just a, a, a longer uh, nose, uh, both vertically and horizontally. Narrow palpebral fissures, so the, the space when your, your eyes are open, that amount of space. Uh, smaller teeth, an unpronounced uh, philtrum. Remember the philtrum is that space in, right in between your nose and your mouth. And that's that same defect that we see in fetal alcohol syndrome. Lower positioned ears, hypertellerism, so the eyes are further apart, and a cleft palate. So here's uh, DeGeorge syndrome, and this is a very, very classic example. Uh, so you can see some of the DeGeorge facies here, and can't really see some of the other ones. Uh, so definitely you can see the cleft palate. There's the wider space in between the eyes. Uh, the, well, that's, that's not pointing in the right place, but you can see the high and broad nasal bridge here, much broader nose than somebody of this particular ethnic background. Slightly smaller chin. And then if you were to look, you'd see slightly lower placed ears. And then here's a couple other children with uh, DeGeorge syndrome. Uh, again, you can see here, you can see the uh, sort of absent falthrum. Uh, you can see a, a bit of a longer nose, especially on this child, and smaller chin. Slightly lower placed ears here. So anyhow, DeGeorge syndrome is much more than congenital heart defect. Uh, but uh, we'll address this sometime later in the future. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know.